tissues here. Famous one 
is 5,000 he feeds 4,000 another time, and that's in the Decapolis. Okay, but this is what you need. This is what Alexander the Great would build in all of these polises, all of these cities that he would conquer and then start building. All right, so in a polis, you need six things. All right, so the first one is a theater. That sounds all right, right? Like, let's go watch some plays. Let's be entertained. No big deal. We all like to watch stories and plays and movies. Good for you. Okay, the second one is an arena. You've ever seen any movies about gladiators? Then you know what this is about. Arena is the Latin word for sand. They had to be filled with sand so they could soak up blood because this is where you went to watch people die in real life. Okay, in the theater, someone might get stabbed and oh. for fake, right? Like it's a it's a play. But if you want to see somebody die in real life, if that's what entertains you, that's what your base pleasure is, then you go to the arena and you watch people fight to the death and you watch people get eaten by lions and you just watch people die for fun. Okay, that's lots of fun to do. All right. Um, the third thing you need is a hippodrome. Hippodrome is where there were chariot races. This is early NASCAR. Okay, so lots of fun. There's lots of death and crashes and stuff there too. All right, the fourth thing you need is a gymnasium, which sounds normal and like you know, something you know, something about. But gymnasium comes from the Greek word gymnos, which means naked. Okay? So, where the gymnasium was not just for physical training, it was for physical training, yes, but it was also where they went to school. Boys and girls were separate. They would hear lectures and um, learn lessons and all kinds of things that they were interested in learning about, but they would do it naked, okay? They would do it naked. The philosophy of Hellenism of the Greeks is that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. There's nothing greater on this earth than a human being, than humankind. Okay, their idea is we are everything, right? So if man is the measure of all things, then the human body is beautiful and should be celebrated and should be looked at all the time. So let's be naked. Like when I was trying to find a picture of Greece, I was like looking like let's show the differences between the cultures and Persia. Let's show Greece. Let's show Rome. I had a very hard time finding an appropriate picture of Greece because they're all they're naked in all the pictures because they were naked all the time. It's just, it's just their culture, okay? All right? So, there's naked people. And in the fifth thing is an agora, which is a shopping center. None of this sounds too crazy, right? Like, these are all things we still kind of have today. Okay? We don't usually fight to the death, but we have boxing and MMA and all that kind of stuff, right? Like, we have gymnasium, we have the Olympics. Anybody ever heard that the original Olympics were naked? It's true. They were naked because the Greeks love to be naked, okay? All right, so we put clothes on it, at least for a time being. I think we're moving back towards closer to this. Christianity actually ended up having a big influence on Hellenism, and so we kind of, you know, made it a little bit more moral, but as we're, as a society, as Western society is moving away from Christianity, we think we're inventing something new, but the truth is, we're just going back to our original Greek Hellenistic roots, okay? Um, and the sixth thing is the temple. You gotta have religion, right? What, like a, a jail? Or like an office? Um, for people? They, they, they die. Okay, so temple um, to what to the gods of the cities. So 
So this is not like church like we think of. Like in the city of Corinth, the goddess of that city is Aphrodite. All right, so you go, you know, it's all about fertility. There's temple prostitution. You want to go worship your deity, you can go sleep with a prostitute, and that's how you go to church. All right, so for most people and cultures, this seems like a great culture, right? Like every base pleasure that the human body has, they're going to satisfy it, okay? There's not really, there's no real morals here, right? Like, let's just have fun. In fact, they are the inventors of moral relativism. We think we invented that? No, the Greeks did. Which means, if it's good for you, do it. It's good for you, feels good for you, you want to do it, do it. Doesn't really matter if it offends somebody else, who cares? It's good for you, you do it. You live your truth, right? Again, we think we invented that, but we didn't. It, it came from Greeks, right? So, this is the culture that Alexander the Great is spreading. So, it shows you why he did not have that much opposition. He didn't have a lot of rebellion. Because he brings, he's like, hey, you're going to be Greek now, but look, what, look what's involved in being Greek. Isn't it fun? Okay? And for most people in that region, they had no problem with this. Right? They were already practicing a lot of these things. There was already a lot of murder. There was already a lot of temple prostitution. Like, to worship your God in this way was not super weird to them. Now they get entertained with, like, gladiator fights and theater and, you know, shopping centers and things like that. So now they just picked everything up a notch. But there is one area, one place, one people group that they conquer that's going to have a really big problem with Hellenistic culture. Who is it? Yes. The Israelites, the Jews, yes. And then the Christians, right? Like, that's where we're going with this, this New Testament. So, yes, you're right. All right, but right now we're intertestamental period, so it starts with the Jews. Everybody else is like, woohoo, let's be Greek. And the Jew, the true Jews who are trying to follow God's word, who are trying to live their life by what God says in the scriptures, are like, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't, this is too much. Right? Like we can't do this. So, there's a lot of things and a lot of people groups and a lot of words and vocabulary that are born out of this period that show up in the New Testament that we never saw in the Old Testament. All right? Because of, they're in, sort of invented or created out of trying to combat Hellenistic influence and Hellenistic culture. All right, the first group is the Pharisees. All right, if you, when you, we start reading the Gospels, the Pharisees are going to be everywhere. Do you remember a single time in the Old Testament where we read about the Pharisees? <coughs> you don't. They're not in there. They're not in there, okay? They're born out of this period. Now, we did talk about it some towards the end because we talked a little bit about, like, you know, connections. But they're not, you don't read Pharisee in the Old Testament because they're born in the intertestamental period. They're created in that 400 years, in that one little blank page, right, separating old and new. But this is why they come about. This is why they do what they do. Now, in the New Testament, we, we just because we're humans and it's normal for us, we generalize and we stereotype. Because most of the encounters that Jesus had with Pharisees were bad, we assume they were all bad. They weren't all bad, okay? We get the record of the ones who were bad, for sure, and as a general rule, what the Pharisees had become by Jesus' day was not really, you know, authentically what God wanted them to be. But they started out good, okay? So in this time period, the Pharisees start out good. They are common people, common everyday people, like things like blue collar workers who study and teach the Word of God. Okay? And people love them, alright? The Jewish people 
love the Pharisees at this time, right? Because they're encouraging them, they're teaching God's words, they're combating Hellenism, and they're common everyday people. During this time period, the Pharisees had, there was a saying, a famous saying that says, you cannot dig with the crown, all right? Which just meant you can't make money off of teaching God's word. All right, so the crown, you know, like God's word is the crown jewels, he's king of the universe, and you think of their agricultural people, you can't dig and plant and make crops, whatever. You can't make money off of teaching the scriptures. So they had other jobs, and most of them were common, everyday, ordinary people jobs, and then they did this on the side. So they weren't taking advantage of people. Okay, and that was the whole point of you not making money off of it was that what happens is what we saw happen a lot in the Old Testament with the high priest and how that all got corrupted was that and false prophets, right? Certain people with money wanted the prophets, wanted the priests to say certain things that they wanted to hear, start teaching certain things that they wanted to hear. So they're slipping money under the table and all of a sudden God's word is corrupted. Because these are supposed to be the people who are representing God, who are teaching God's word, but they're not. They're just, they're being bought. So the Pharisees didn't want to see that happen, so this is how they start. Now, it develops into a whole other issue, okay, where because the people love it, this happens anytime, any place happens in America today. If you see any of these documentaries or news reports about famous pastors and musicians and all these famous churches, and then the pastor ends up in like mega sin. It's just because anytime people are like worshipped and idolized, it's just a corruption to the heart. So the same thing happens with the Pharisees later on. But right now, they're the good guys. Okay? The other thing that comes out of this period is the synagogue. So, remember, it's like a church building. It's just a building where the um, scripture is read and studied. Even. 
even the high priest. So remember from Leviticus, Aaron is the first high priest. And God goes to great lengths to talk about who qualifies as a high priest and what that high priest has to do to maintain that position. Everything they have to do to go in and make those sacrifices and atone for Israel, right? The high priest is a big deal. That's a very holy position, okay? We're going to talk about this a little bit later when we talk, or probably tomorrow when we talk about Messiah. The word Messiah just means anointed one. In the Old Testament, there were two people that were considered anointed ones, all right? That was the high priest and the king, okay? So the high priest is supposed to be anointed by God. It's a very holy, sacred position, and people are just buying it. Like here, you know, like paying Rome money, and Rome's the leader of the day, so they say, oh, you can be the high priest. All right, so at this point, the temple and all it represents and all its representatives are kind of just a mockery of what it's supposed to be, of what God intended it to be, all right, which is going to make a lot of sense to us when we read about Jesus going in and clearing the temple. All that's going to come into play for that, okay? So the Sadducees are, um, you know, they're the most high up in the Jewish religious order at this time. But they kind of declare and, and, and enact laws and things like that. But for the most part, people, common Jewish people hated them. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Sadducees. What time is that? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Okay. All right. So the next group we want to talk about is the Essenes. Jesus very often mentions scribes and Pharisees. When he starts talking about the scribes, most people are pretty sure he's talking about this group called the Essenes. So the Essenes were like the extremists of the Jews, when they saw all of this happening here in these polices and everybody's naked all the time and it's so against God's word, they're like, we gotta get out of here. Like, they're thinking about like Sodom and Gomorrah, they're like, God's gonna send something and we don't wanna be anywhere near it. Like, we're gonna get out of here. So they're separatists, they separate themselves from society, okay? Yeah, kind of like that. Separatists and purists, so they try to follow the law as much as they possibly can. They live in caves in the wilderness. And they take no part in any type of culture. They were communal Meaning they just shared everything they had, right? Like they just worked together as a community and shared everything they had. And they just lived um, very, very strict rules to try to follow God's laws exactly, like to the extreme. Remember how we talked about the Pharisees having the Ten Commandments and building these like fences of rules around the Ten so, like, you can break one and get in trouble, but you didn't get close to breaking this one. So the Essenes were, like, at, like this whole board full, but, like, with bombs. Like, they were insanely strict about following the Torah. This is how strict they were, okay? So, we know this from historians. The Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day? The Jews tell you you can't do any work, and they would get really, really strict about it. Like, you can only take so many steps a day. If you took, like, one more step than that, then you were breaking the Sabbath, and that would work. Here's the Essenes. And I'm 100% serious. You could not go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. You had to hold it for the 24 hours of the Sabbath. Because they thought it was work. Like, it, it's work for the body to expel waste. So you don't go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. Which to me is crazy because it takes way more work for me to hold it, right? Like, my body's been way more work to hold it than to go. But that was what they believed, and they did not go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. 
They were extremists. They were purists. They wanted nothing to do with Greek culture, and they tried everything they possibly could to avoid it and to follow the law. Yes? So I thought the whole, like, certain steps, what if, like, you're outside and you're, like, trying to get your house, and you, like, get right there, and then you can't take any more steps? It was all relevant. So, like, the Pharisees, they would come up with little loopholes for themselves, you know, but then if you were just regular common guy and then you did that, then they get mad. We're going to come across the scene where Jesus' disciples are eating just little heads of grain. They just pick the grain and eat it on the Sabbath because they're hungry and the Pharisees go nuts. And then Jesus uses that to teach a lesson. It's really, it's really amazing. Okay, but we'll get there because it was crazy. All right, so these are the essays. Now, what do you do when you live in a cave all day and you don't participate in any culture and you can't do anything else? You copy the scripture over and over and over and over again. Okay? So that's what they did. They were scribes. They copied God's words. They copied the Old Testament scrolls. And then they wrote down, copied and wrote down some other um, texts that they came up with themselves, that they wrote themselves, or that came out at that time period. Why is this important? Because I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a cave written by these Essenes. The Dead Sea Scrolls are important because they're the oldest copies of the Old Testament scriptures. Like when we found, when we, when people found the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think it's 1947-ish, I'm not great with dates, don't know that, 40s, it was in the 40s. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they were a thousand years older than the oldest copy we had of the Old Testament scriptures. And they were so thorough, and the community was so thorough about how they copied and how they write, it validated our translation. So there's always this thing about, this is, did things get lost in translation, right? So when we see these copies that are a thousand years older than what we had previously, then, and, and everything lines up, and everything matches, then it gives a lot of credibility to the scriptures we have in our hands today. So we can say, you know what, we got we got a good copy. Is every is every translation perfect with everything how they do? No. But the message and what we do have is very very accurate. Yes. How old? Where did where did we get our oldest scriptures before that? Because if the Essenes wrote it at say 300 BC, and if it was a thousand, but some years, of it was copies, right? But they're copies. So like the original copy, or like no, because if it was a thousand years older, that means the thing before we got the yeah, scrolls. Not very old. That means that it was seven hundred AD, which is relatively not old. Right. So like, I yeah, I don't know all the exact dates, but some of it was like copies that they had that they were copying from. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. So, so even though the Essenes took things to the extreme. Right? They took things to the extreme, but they were very holy. They were trying to follow God's word. And they gave us a really important piece of biblical history with those scrolls and copying those things. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, there are, at this point, so what happens is this is kind of what's going on. Everything in the Greek Empire is going really well as long as Alexander the Great is leading. The problem is Alexander the Great dies, and the empire is split between four generals. The two generals that are important to New Testament history are Ptolemy, And the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemy, and his the general name is the is Seleucius. Okay, but they're called the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and they are kind of in the um, they kind of divide up the like Egypt and Judea region now. For a while, the Ptolemies are ruling our, the Judean area, and everything's going okay, all right? Um, Ptolemy is supported Cleopatra, right? The Cleopatra that's, like, famous with 
Mark Anthony choose a Ptolemy. People didn't choose Egyptian, she's not. She's a Ptolemy. Okay? Alright. So, and Cleopatra was part of ruling in Egypt. Then, but what happens is the Seleucids then take over. Seleucids take over Judea. And things go really, really bad from that point on. The Seleucid kings end up in control, and there's some really bad ones. The worst one is Antiochus Epiphanes, and we'll talk. I got a, a lot to write about him, so we'll pick that up tomorrow. Because it's time to go. So make sure you have everything in front of the board. Put your Bibles back on the table. And I'll see you tomorrow. And I'm going to pray that this video works out.